the day you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he went to that cross and died for your sins so that you will never have to feel the judgment of it. He felt all the judgment of our sins, was buried and raised on the, uh, from the dead on the third day. And the day you believed it, he filled your cup, whether you know it or not. He filled your cup. And it's called the cup of blessings. It's called the cup of blessings. And Bible doctrine is the most wonderful thing in the whole wide world because it tells you what's in that cup. See, your cup is full, but you don't know what it's full of. You know, people talk that way, don't they? They're always telling us what we're full of, aren't they? Always. Everybody's got an opinion what you're full of. But the truth of the matter is, God has filled your cup full of blessings in every area of your life at work. Do you know that? Not just, you, not just the fact that you have a job. But you bring a cup to that job that's full of blessings from which everybody can experience and participate. We're going to talk about that cup of blessings today. If you'll go with me to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. If you was to read the 10th chapter, which is 33 verses, you would find that Paul went into a large discussion on the cultural influence of idolatry. And entire chapters devoted to this subject. And I'm looking at one section of that. Our context for today's lesson begins in verse 14, dealing with the cup of the world versus the cup of the church. The cup of the world. The world offers the devil. As soon as he finds out there's a cup in the church, he offers one. He's the biggest copycat that you'll ever meet in this world. He disguised himself as an angel of light, of an angel of light, but he is totally in utter darkness. And how he can sell that is of great interest to me. It should be of you. How he can sell you that he is an angel of light and you believe that shows he knows how to sell that deal. Now, in the 10th chapter, look at verse 14. He comes, he's in this great subject, and it's go, the whole chapter is about idolatry. He said, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to, as to wise men. Uh, you judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless as sharing in the blood of Christ? Now, what's interesting is the word not. It's not a normal word. Normally, this word in the Greek language is either ukerme, it's not. This word is O-U-C-H-I, uke. When it's used in the Greek language, it gives you the answer. And the answer is always yes. Now, in, ver in this verse, he's going to ask two questions. And the word not is uke. And it means the answer is yes. Do you have that? Yes. <laughs> One person graduated from class. We got to do better. Now, here's what he says. Look at verse 16. Is not the cup of blessings which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? What's the answer? Yes. Thank you. See, open book test with the Lord is, is grace. See, you always get the right answer if you pay attention. Is not the bread. See, the word not, that's okay. Is not the bread which we break as sharing in the body of Christ. What's the answer? Yes. And do you know what this is true for? Second person plural. Everybody who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ is included in this. You can say yes to both of them. He dealt with the cup, and he dealt with the bread of the Eucharist, which we'll do in the second half. 
is not the cup of blessings. Notice the cup is the cup of blessing which we bless, which we bless is the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the, body, in the blood of Christ? The answer is yes. The sharing is inclusive. We all are going to share in it. And that's through salvation. Is not the bread which we break. Notice the cup of blessing we bless. Notice the bread that's broken we break. Is not the bread which we break a sharing. The bread breaking is a sharing. See, in the ancient world, there was one loaf kind of like all of us. Now you go to the store, you buy one loaf, and it's already sliced for you. But in the old day, you went and got a loaf of bread like Grandma used to make. Right? In the old wood stove. That's amazing to me how she kept that temperature going. And that bread always came out. And it always had a, a good smell to it, depending on the wood. Well, anyhow. I got lost there for a moment. Did you notice that? I dropped back to when I was a kid. Now, watch this. Now, the word since is based on verse 16. Since there is one bread, one loaf, we who are many are one body because the bread's the body, the cup's the blood. The cup's the blood, the bread's the body. That's verse 16, right? Look at verse 16. Okay. Since there is one bread, we who are many... By the way, do you know how many pieces of bread in a loaf today, a typical loaf of bread? Do you know how many pieces of bread? Anybody? I mean, do you really know or are you just guessing? 15? 16? Well, let me tell you something. There was a time in your life when you were first married and very young and hungry. And you had a couple kids. You knew how many pieces of bread was in a loaf because it was called sandwiches. And you knew that a loaf of bread could only go a certain length of time. And if you, had, you got paid every two weeks or something, you had to buy enough bread to be able to fix them uh, a sandwich, right, to go to school. I guarantee you, there was a day when you knew how many slices were in it. We're so spoiled and we're so affluent. Yes. <laughs> Wouldn't I know? Siri? Siri. So how many is there, Siri? 24. Are we not spoiled with that, folks? Well, there you go, 24. I knew somebody would get that off Siri. There's no, I knew that, I knew somebody's going to get that. Well, anyhow, <laughs> my point was we got one loaf of bread. One loaf of bread in this church is going to feed 24. All right? So we're going to have to have several loaves. But the truth of the matter is there is one loaf, the one body of Jesus Christ. It takes care of every person that would ever come to him ever in the world for all time. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That's one big loaf of bread. <laughs> that is one big loaf of bread. And so it is. And so he says, since there is one, one loaf of bread, we who are many are one body, we are all partake, partakers, or we all partake of the one bread. <clears throat> and that's all I'm interested in today. And then he goes on back to the subject. I'm only interested in it. Well, let me read the rest of it through 21. Look at the nation Israel. <clears throat> Are not those who eat the sacrifices share in the altar? Yes. <clears throat> what do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? 
No, 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 no. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they are sacrificed to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup, cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. You can't. They're contradictory. See, the devil's got his own Eucharist. Runs it in the world. It runs off the table of demonics, demonism, idolatry. And so there's where we are. Now, the other thing I want, to, I want you to know about this, ver, about this section Here's what I want you to know. Verses 14 through 21 have five Greek sentences. There's only five Greek sentences in this. And I wrote them on the, in the second column of your paper, the second paragraph. There are five Greek sentences. Now, this is important to our study today. Verse 14 is a sentence. 15 is a sentence. 16 and 17 is a sentence. 18 and 20 through 20 is a sentence. And verse 21 is a sentence in the Greek language. Now, that's important to our study today because I have get, I'm, my lesson comes from two verses, 16 and 17, which is one Greek sentence or one complete thought. So I'm going back to 16. He asks two questions that he gives you the answer, yes. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the body of Christ? Yes. Is not the bread which we break a sharing? Notice the word sharing is a common. A sharing, a sharing in the body of Christ. Yes, since we have two yeses, since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, we all partake of the one bread. Okay? One bread. So let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to come, and we're going to look at today, not so much the bread idea, but the cup idea. Okay? I'm going to look at the cup of blessings today. Let's pray. I give you that mode of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. And why it's important is the study of the Bible. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't, you can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the church age is personal sin. Personal sin should be confessed so that the Holy Spirit who indwells those who believe the gospel, you may have, you may, you may have wandered away from him, but he hasn't wandered away from you. Because John 14, 16 says that once he enters, he's not permitted to leave. Now, how do I get back into fellowship with this indwelling third member of the Godhead that lives inside my body and has made my body a mobile church, a temple of God? How do I do that? I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9. Could be mental attitude type of sins. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt sins. You confess whatever is on your heart that God is trying to pressure you about. You confess it. You name it. You cite it. And then you study the Bible with him this morning and get something. You'll get something this morning, not it, you know, if you confess that sin. So, Father, we're thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace. We thank you, Father, for each person that's come our way today to be challenged by the word of God within our mental attitudes uh, how will we run in our life? God has, God sent his sons that you would, you would come to a place in your life where you would let God direct your life because your life has destiny with God. Your life has destiny. You don't have to keep gambling with your life. You don't keep ha have to do that. Sit down with the greatest counselor of all counselors, and that's the, that's the Lord. Let the Lord direct your life. Let the Lord show you. Let the Lord begin to show you what your life, why you're on earth at this time in human history. Why you are on earth this time in human history. Help us today, Father, to understand that in Christ we have a cup of blessings. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Turn the fans on. I was trying to at the beginning of my lesson. He wanted me to turn the fans on. I told him I had already given the introduction to do that. 
Note that our lesson text is one Greek sentence. Verse 16 and 17 is one Greek sentence that's important to us because it's one completed thought. Now, it's amidst a lot of thoughts on idolatry, but he's warning us in the church, listen, this may be the first time in a long time that you've taken part in the Eucharist. Do you know what kind of Eucharist you've been doing since then? You say, Ron, the last time, a guy told me not long ago, the last time I took a Eucharist was 10 years ago, the Lord's Supper. The last time I took it was Lord's Supper. I said, well, do you know, that's not, that, that may be true that's the last time you sat at the Lord's table, but I said, do you know whose table you've been sitting at and doing the Eucharist for the last 10 years? He went, no, I don't know. I turned him to this passage of Scripture, and I said, either you're at the table of the devil or you're at the table of the Lord. You're not without one or the other, buddy, or gal, or whoever you are. Am I going to get in trouble like Biden because they call you gals? Uh, boy, what a mess he's in because he's friendly. <laughs> Jeez. Well, you won't have to worry about that with me. <laughs> You're safe with Al and I. <laughs> I'm the most friendly guy between the two of us, <laughs> so you're in pretty good shape here. I can tell you that. Note that our lesson text is one Greek sentence. It, is, it will be used It will be used in this context to focus on the four points of the Eucharist cup of blessings. Let me be sure that you understand from this text. If you, are, if you got the courage to read 33 verses this week, You've been, listen, if you're a believer in Christ or if you're not a believer in Christ, you've been at one or two of, of the Eucharist tables. You've either been at the table of the devil or you've been the table of God. But you haven't been independent as you think you are because either you're with Christ or you're against Christ. If you're against Christ, you're in the devil's sphere of influence. And the writer makes it very, Paul makes it very clear, you're either at the table of the Lord or you're at the table of the devil, and you need to wake up. That's what this whole chapter's about. You ought to go back and read it. You haven't been set doing nothing for the last 10 years. You've been playing with the devil. Now, I didn't have to tell him all that because when he read 1 Corinthians 10, the Lord told him all of that. I'm telling you that just in case you ain't got the courage to read 33 verses. I hope you have. Because there's no such thing as, in the, there's no such thing as, well, I'm not in one or the other. You're either carnal or spiritual. You're either saved or not saved. You're either, either at the table of the devil or the table of the Lord. This is what this book tells you. It is the only book it's the only possession that you have you can leave this world with. There's nothing. You can't take another thing you have with you except the Bible. When you die, you can take the Bible if it's in your soul. It's the eternal word of God. There's no other, no other book like it. You will never put anything else in your soul that will ever leave this earth except the word of God. And you pay no attention to it. The, the, the days flow by, the weeks flow by, and you don't study, don't read it. Then you wonder why your life is in a mess. The good news is that he can clean it all up. Come on, prodigal son. You need to read Luke 15. The Lord's in the cleaning business. It's called cleansing. He's in the cleaning business. Whew, ah, that ought to make you happy. God ought to make you happy. Jesus Christ, the cup that he drank was our sins. The cup that we drink through salvation is blessings. When he drank the cup, the cup of the sins of the world, it was cursing upon him. When we drink through salvation, when we drink the cup, it's blessings upon us. Blessings upon us. What a wonderful... And you know how you get it? By grace. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You get it by grace. 
I think that's why it's so abused by so many people. And he's not going to change the system. It's always by grace. God treats you in grace. He treat, there's two things you can bank on when God, when God deals with you. He deals with you in love and grace. That's for sure. Today's lesson goes along with our present Sunday special on the theology of the blood of Christ. That was kind of my Easter preparation. The blood of Christ, and what we've been studying on, Tuesday, on, a, on a Sunday are the, the theology of the blood of Christ. It's the nine factors of communion with God through the Eucharist cup, the blood of Christ. The cup refers to the blood of Christ. When he drank the cup, he drank our sins. It was cursing. When we drink it through salvation, it's blessings. You just always remember that. When you drink this cup today, you're drinking the blessings that God has provided through the propitious death of Christ on the cross to flow through your life to others. You know, one of the greatest things about ministry to the Lord is the influence it has upon your life that's so amazing that flows to other people in the most amazing ways. The impact that Christ has on your life will flow from you to impact other people's life. The things that impact you. That is for sure. Now, we have studied four of these. We have studied... Reconciliation through the blood of Christ. We have studied redemption through the blood of Christ. We have studied propitiation through the blood of Christ. We have studied justification through the blood of Christ. That's our last four lessons. Now we're going to bring those four together in the Eucharist today. They all, they all fit the cup. Agreed? Why? Because the cup is identified with the blood of Christ. The bread is identified with his body. So here's point one today. I, I, I think I got four points. I don't know how many points I got. One, two, three, I don't know. We'll, we'll take them as far as we get with them. How many points? I got four. Four points. Four points. <laughs> Thank you, William. I count on William. Takes him ten times. Takes William listens to something ten times and he's got it. Thank God. It's good, good, it's good to know how many times you have to hear something to get it. At least he's got that down. We begin by examining our lesson text. Now, this should be not Romans 16, 16. It should, it should be 1 Corinthians 10, 16. 10, not 16, 16. Notice that 1 Corinthians 10, 16 begins with two Greek rhetorical questions requiring, yes, that's uke, O-U-C-H-I. That's an, an, when you see that, you know what you have in the Greek language. It's not uke and it's not me. That's the other ones, no and no. This is ukme, and it, when you see it in the Greek language, it says, yes, definitely yes, definitely yes. So it's an open book test that everybody can get. And he says, is not the cup of blessing which, the cup of blessing which we bless? Eulageo uh, uh, is an interesting word because it means to speak well of, or we would probably say praise. To speak well of. The cup of blessings which we speak well of. Or which we praise God for. The cup of blessing which we praise God for. That's how he says this. The cup of blessings which we bless. The in other words, the cup of blessing, listen, it flows in you and flows out of you. It flows to God in praise. It flows to others in information. It's a wonderful idea. It's not the cup uh, that uh, we bless a sharing of the blood of Christ, a sharing, a cornelia. That's where you get the idea of communion. You know, some people call the Eucharist communion. Some people call the Lord's Supper. Some call it Eucharist. The, why they call it communion is this word sharing. It is the word cornelia. It, it means communion fellowship. We, we all share the cup of the blood of Christ 
which now is the cup of blessings, we all share it in unison because we are many, but there's one cup. There's only one blood of Christ that we all share in as a body of Christ. So that's, that's the point. He does it with the cup, and then he comes back and does it with the bread. And the answer is yes. Yes. And, and what is the cup of blessing and the bread we bake, break in communion? It is a picture of God's grace. This is a picture. The Eucharist is a picture of God's grace. It's a picture of God, God's grace, for we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. It's a gift. It's a gift. Note how Paul closes. Now, don't do it right now, but later, look how he closes 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. How he closes it. What is the last thing Paul says? He doesn't say goodbye. That's the last thing we usually say. What, but what he does say is interesting. So I wrote down 2 Corinthians 13, 14, how he closed 2 Corinthians. Okay? Here's what he says. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what was called benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship, Cornelia, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's a benediction. Do you see in that the three members of the Godhead? Do you see that? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let's go back and take a look. Let's go back and take a look. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the whole picture of salvation. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would die in our place, substitutionary, that we could, we could receive his place, the righteousness of God. He took our unrighteousness so we could have his righteousness. He took our death so we could have his eternal life. That's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the love of the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The love of God. The love of God was demonstrated towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. The fellowship, the, the fellowship, the communion that the Holy Spirit has with our human spirit in our identity with Christ in this lost pagan world we live in. You know anything about the fellowship? One of the reasons the Holy Spirit is in you is to have fellowship with you, with the Father. You know anything about that? Do you know anything... I'll tell you when you know it is when the Holy Spirit is touching the human spirit in a very personal, intimate way. He does it through prayer. He does it, does it through speaking the word of God to other people. He does it through witnessing. He does it through a million ways. Do you know anything about communion with the Holy Spirit who lives inside you? I'm not talking about, listen, I'm talking about walking in the Spirit. That's commanded. This, this is not commanded. This is what, if you will walk in the Spirit, this is what He'll do with your human spirit. He will love on you. He will guide you. He, he, will, he will give you the fruit. He will give you the love and the joy and the peace and the patience. That's communion. When your spirit sees that God put love into you when love couldn't be there, the flesh would have never put love where, where He just put it. The, the, the Spirit of God in communion will put peace in your soul where you could, you've never been able to have it before. He will put the patience in you where you never had it before, and He will speak in communion, in communion to your spirit, and your spirit will say, Oh, thank you, dear God. 
it will begin to praise him. The, the cup of the blessings will become the blessings of praise. Do you know that? You got to bring that doctrine, all this doctrine you've been studying, you got to bring it and channel it into your personal life and make sense out of why you're saved. Why did I, why am I saved, Ron? Just to go to heaven? No, it's to have a, dynamite, a dynamic life now. Look, can I tell you something personal? If you were saved before 12, now I want you to hear me. And I don't mean that you haven't lived since that period of time for Christ. I mean, in your heart, you know, Ron, I can put, listen, I, I, I haven't lived for Christ. Listen, Ron, I haven't done it. But I know that I was saved before I was 12 years old. I know my heart. I believe. I heard it. I believe the gospel of Christ. I, I, I've wandered off. Can I tell you something? If you were saved before 12, can I tell you something? I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to me very carefully. The Lord, listen, the Lord put his hand on you at a very young age for mission. You need to really pay attention. If you got saved before 12, you need to really pay attention to me today. Now, I'm speaking to somebody in here. He has called you into missions. Real mission work for God. I mean real ministry. When he puts a hand on a really a young cultural person, he did it with Joseph, he did it with David. I mean, you just go down the list. God did it with Jesus. Before he was 12, by 12 he was into ministry. If you got saved before 12, you need to get back. You need to get, you need, listen. Listen. You need to personally come and see me. I've been moody. I'm out there at least Chick-fil-A. On Mondays from 7.30 to 9.30, climb out of bed. I'm over here at Roebuck the rest of the week. Or give me a call and I'll set up a personal appointment with you. I'm telling you, it's a big deal. You need to pay attention to that. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship, the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want you to keep that in mind today when we take part, part, take part in the Eucharist, the second hour. Point number two, the Eucharist reminds us that the one body sacrificially offered by Jesus Christ and his one blood sacrificially offered are always sufficient to all who believe the gospel of grace, the grace gospel. All, always sufficient. I mean, we get some places in our life where we think, ah, God is just not working in my life. This is, listen, 2 Corinthians 12, chapter, verse 9, grace is sufficient. If it's not sufficient, you're not paying attention to it because grace is always sufficient. God, listen, when we talk about grace, we're talking about that God is always sufficient. And how he measures grace out to you is always sufficient for the time, for the moment in your life. It's always sufficient. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Sufficient. It's always enough, sufficient. It's always adequate. It's always enough. It's not a, it's not a, not a little bit too much, not a bit, little bit too li little. It's, you know, oh, that bed was too hard. Oh, that bed was too soft. 
So he fell asleep in the babies. The word sense is kind of interesting because it emphasizes the two yes questions in, in chapter 16. That should be 1016, by the way. Since there is, yes, yes, since there is one bread, yes, we who are many are one. Oh, really? Yes. Zay requires yes. <laughs> See, the word sense means what I'm going to, we're not through with the sentence, right? There, one Greek sentence, 16, 17, one Greek sentence. The two yeses now become yes, yes. Since there is one bread, yes. We who are many are one body, yes. We all partake of one body, yes. <laughs> That's verse 17. Verse 17 requires yes, yes, yes. And at some point, you ought to go like, hooray. I really rooted for Auburn. It's unusual. I got when I was going, yes, yay. That was me last night to bring a national, a, a national championship back home to Alabama. And they really played good. They really played good. They had a great year, and I salute all the Auburn people. They represented our, our, our state well. They conducted themselves well, and, and they played well, and, you know, it just couldn't be, and that's, that's sad. But what a great year that basketball team had. What a great year. Partaking in the Eucharist reminds us that we are, listen, today when we take part, it's one cup and one, 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 it's one, cup and one bread, and we all participate because the picture that God wants us to see is that we're one body of Christ. We are one people. Paul says when one part of the body pains, the whole body pains. When one part of the body gets promoted, we all get promoted. We all celebrate. We all celebrate one another. When somebody is in difficulty, we're all in difficulty. When everybody's happy, we're all happy. We're all happy that they're happy. You know how you get that in a church? You don't get it because you come to church. You get it because, listen to me, because you come to church in communion with the Holy Spirit. Koinonia. You come, you get it because you come with koinonia, with your human spirit being communed by the Holy Spirit. That's how you get it. And what a blessing it is to be part of a body of Christ that's in communion, who understands the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit with the human spirit that gives dynamics and purpose and meaning to their life and to their church. I mean, I can't wait from Sunday to Tuesday to be back with you again. I can't wait from Tuesday to get back with you on Wednesday then I have this long, drawn-out time. i got to wait Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I get some of you back on Saturday in the School of Biblical Theology. I can't wait to get back to you on Sunday. It's communion with me. This, this is family. This is the body of Christ. This is, this is what I live with. This is the family. I miss them when I'm away. When I go off on, on vacation or go someplace, I miss my family. I can't wait to get back to my family, to commune with you, those of you where we are one spirit in Christ. We have the same mind about missions and, and matters, matters of the heart. Well... Here's the third thing. Sharing, communion, koinonia, is clearly symbolic, but symbolic, the cup and the... And let me tell you why. Here's a fact. While we're taking part in the Eucharist, Jesus Christ, and this is important, 
at the same time we're communing with him, what's he doing? He is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven while the Eucharist is being celebrated on earth. He's not here. In any sense of the word, he's not here. He won't be here in our presence until the second coming of Christ. He will not be in our presence until the second coming of Jesus. I'm talking about the real Jesus Christ. This is a period of absence from the presence of the person of Jesus Christ. Who is seated in a resurrected body at the right hand of God the Father. That bit of theology is really important to us. Hebrews, the first chapter, verse 3. Listen to what he says. After making purification of sins, that's cleansing, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's where he is in person until the second coming of Christ. When he returns, he'll bring some with him and the rest will be caught up, 1, Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians 4, in what we call the rapture. Here's a second fact that's important. It is also clear that under the new covenant, we celebrate his first coming in the Eucharist while proclaiming his second coming. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim his death until he comes. You proclaim it. You proclaim he's, he's coming again, and his presence will be very important. These two facts is what makes the Eucharist symbolic, and that's very important. Now, the only way we experience his presence is through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit would come, you need to read John 14, 15, 16, 17. When the Holy Spirit would come, he would be the witness of Christ from our life. The Holy Spirit causes us to have a sense of the presence of Christ in his absence. You know, he's not on earth, and he won't be on earth, won't even be in the atmosphere of the earth until the second coming of Christ. If you read Acts, the first chapter, 9 through 11, he won't, listen, he's not even in the atmosphere until the second coming of Christ. When he comes and in the cloud, as you saw him go up, he will come back. You need to be careful with all this stuff. Hebrews 9.28 says that the work of salvation is completed in the first coming of Christ the second coming of Christ has nothing to do with salvation over sin. He will come a second time, Hebrews 9.28, without reference to sin. Do you realize today, see the right hand of God the Father, sin is not the issue. Sin isn't the issue today. Salvation is the issue. Christ died on the cross to take care of the sin. Did you know that? My goodness, people, come on. Let me close. The Eucharist reminds us that we are one body in Christ through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, you got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where you know it or not, when you got saved. The baptism of the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation places you into union with Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Positionally, the moment you got saved, you were placed there in time and eternity. Listen to what Paul wrote. For by one Spirit, Holy Spirit, we are all baptized into one body, the church, 
whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Uh, Paul talks about this in, Eph in Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verse 27. Now we, we, now you are Christ's body, but individual members. What connects us all? Well, salvation and the communion of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Salvation, ministry of the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. There's our connection. There's our connection. Listen to, listen to what Paul says in Galatians, third chapter, verse 2. This, the only thing I want to find out from you, did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith? You know what the answer is? The hearing of faith. When did I, re and listen to verse 3 for the answer. Listen to verse 3. Having begun, having begun by the Holy Spirit. Having begun what? Having begun the Christian life. How did the Christian life begin? The eight works of the Holy Spirit at salvation. Read the pamphlet of 50 things. Did you realize eight, that when you believe the gospel of Christ, he did eight works in the Holy Spirit upon your life, did eight works? You need, to, you need to know that. You need to know that. How is it possible that you don't know that? He says, the only thing I want to find out from you, when do you think you receive the Holy Spirit? When do you think you receive the Holy Spirit? Well, I'll tell you when. When your life began in Christ, the moment you believe the gospel, your life, you got, you got born again. You got born again by the Holy Spirit. He took up residence in your life for time and eternity. You can read Titus, third chapter, five through seven. And I'm saving the last part of that for today's Eucharist, which we'll talk about after the offering. And downstairs, we'll go down for about 15 minutes in a moment, have some coffee and donuts or whatever the, the Marion brought. I, uh, Marion, had, Marion had duty today. Okay, let's have prayer. Men will take the offering. If you're, if you're a visitor, you're a guest. This meal's been paid for. Just sit tight. Our people who take responsibility for the meal will once again take responsibility. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way today by the automobile and the, and the Internet to study the Word of God in that we've done. Looking at the couple of blessings that we have. Oh, the couple of blessings we're about to take part in a second. Service. Encourage our hearts. Today, Father, I pray that we would be good stewards of everything people have purposed in their heart to give. We will use it, Father, for this, for this ministry here and as far as we can stretch it across the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we've made our prayer in his name. Amen. There are nine elements to the cup. You can read about this in the little pamphlets, 50 things, or you can go online and pick that pamphlet up. 50 things in salvation you can never lose in time and eternity. But there's an interesting part of that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians in your Bible as well. So we have both of these we can work together with. The 11th chapter where the Eucharist is discussed under the New Covenant. The reason we use the word Eucharist rather than the Lord's Table of Communion, which are great, great fine terms, is because of the word giving thanks in verse 24. And, uh, and uh, um, it's a word Eucharistio in the Greek language. And that why many churches use the word Eucharist is for the idea of giving thanks. 
And here's what he says. He says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which you betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, that's the word for Eucharist in the Greek. And when he had given thanks, and, and um, Eucharist is made up of two words. It's made, uh, Eucharist, it's made up of the word you, uh, good or well, and grace, good grace. Uh, the idea of well would be the sufficiency. Everything is always well with you because of the grace of God. Things ought to always, and if you're oriented to grace, if you have that humble attitude of grace orientation, then that's the way things work. And so, because we're very strong grace-oriented people, we, we chose that word of all the different words. And they're all, all, all those words are fine. Well, that's the reason we choose it. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is the body which is for you to remembrance of me. And the word remembrance is important. What does the bread of cup represent? I mean, what does the bread uh, that we take part in the Eucharist, what does the bread represent? It represents the body of Christ. And there's two points to the body of Christ. The first point of the bread of the body of Christ is his body on the cross. Now, listen to me. We become that body called the church. The body of Christ is called the church. Once you're saved under the new covenant, it's called the body of Christ. It is the body of Christ, the literal body of Christ, that bore our sins on his body, which was a perfect body. In, the, in, in every sense of the word, he was born because of the virgin birth. He was born without a damning sin. So that's very important. When you look at the body of Christ that hung on the cross for us, it, it came virgin birth. God, it, the, this, is the, this is the body that comes from God. Virgin birth hypostatic union, which is a, a way to say that God was 100% man and 100% God in one unique person of, of the universe. He was impeccable, meaning that in the 30-some years that he lived on earth, he could not commit sin. Mental sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins, he could not commit them. And therefore, he's called impeccable. And here's how it's described in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin, it doesn't mean no in the sense of, I, well, I know Ron Adema, but rather it is the idea of knowing in the sense of oneness where the, like the two become one in the idea of no. He who knew no sin, never participated in it, never became one with it. He who knew no sin became sin for us, substitutional, so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. So when, he, when, 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 when you put the bread in your mouth, you should say, okay, it was, the, it was the virgin birth of Christ that qualified him at birth to go to the cross. It was his sinless perfection in the sense of impeccable that put him on the cross. He was the hypostatic man. He was the unique man of the no, no other man ever born to 100% God and 100% man. And then when he dies, he's buried, he's raised from the dead, he ascends back to the Father, is seated at the right hand of God the Father in active participation with everything going on in our lives. So there's his body. And when you take part in the, the bread, the bread is his body. Now listen to me. The bread that's represented here reflects on that body to this body, the church. See, Paul made that connection. He said the loaf is one, but it's made up of many people, many members, like a loaf of bread. You know, my grandmother was really excited when she went to the supermarket and they had already sliced the bread. Because if you as a kid that grew up in a home that baked bread, we loved when it first came out of the oven because we just reached up and grabbed a chunk of it. 
So one loaf was just for the grabbers. <laughs> and you slab some good old homemade butter on that and it goes right to your tummy. Well, when we take part in the Eucharist, now listen to me. When we take part in the Eucharist, we're going to do the bread. The first thought in memory, the first part of your memory goes to what Christ, his body, bore our sins, a qualified virgin birth, impeccable, hypostatic union, and the celebrity ship today who sits at the right hand of God the Father. When you remember that he is seated at right hand of God the Father, this brings the second part of the bread to you and that you are part of the bread. You are now... When you got saved, you became part of the body of Jesus Christ, the church. Do you understand that? See, that's the whole subject of 1 Corinthians 12 chapter. 1 Corinthians 12 chapter, that's the whole discussion. Now listen to me. When you take part in the bread, there's two parts in your memory. First, what Christ did on the cross, what he bore on his body so that I could become a part of his body and never have to bear them again. That whatever Christ, whatever his, all the sins that he bore in his body, you will never bear. Those are gone. The sin issue is over. The issue today is not that. The issue today is your participation, your koinonia, your communion in the body of Christ, the church. Are you with me? See, there's two parts to that. Okay. In the next verse, in the same way, giving thanks, in the same way, giving thanks, he took the cup after supper and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance. The cup represents the blood of Christ. Nine things. Now, when he take, drinks the cup, it's all the sins of the world, past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. All the sins of the world. He bore, that's, he shed his blood to cleanse us from all sin. All your sin has been cleansed, past, present, and future, because of the work of Christ on the cross. When you commit a sin in the Christian life, it doesn't do away with what he did on the cross. It, that's not the purpose. The purpose is that work extends to the Christian life for cleansing, for fellowship, for communion with the Holy Spirit. So when you take part in the Eucharist, the cup, you reflect on the one side, you reflect on the blood of Christ. Are you with me? That the blood of Christ took care of all my sins, perhaps... Because he died one death for all. Look, if, you're, if you struggle with that idea, you read, listen to me now, you read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. It'll clear that whole issue up. Christ died one death for all sin for all time. So sin is no longer an issue. Not for salvation. Sin is no longer, salvation is dealt with. Sin is an issue in the Christian life for fellowship or communion with the Holy Spirit. Now, when we participate in this cup, it's called the cup of blessings. And what you should remember about it, first remember that when Christ bore, bore, went to the cross and shed his blood, it was for not only our sins, but our sins in its, in its past, present, and future state. Are you with me? Where are you? All right. On the other side, listen, that's the cup of cursing. He drank the cup of cursing on our behalf. Listen, man. Here's the other side. So that we could drink the cup of what? Blessings. And there are nine things in that cup of the cup of blessings that I want to mention. I want to mention four of them today because we just studied them. If you've been with me the last four weeks, you've studied reconciliation, redemption, propitiation, and justification. Now, when you put that cup to your mouth, you're supposed to do this in remembrance of me. One part is what he did on the cross for you. Agreed? 
Dealing with sin, past, present, future, gone, done. No more sacrifice for sin, right? The other part of that is a cup of blessings, which deals with at least today, you can deal with these four things because we studied them. Just in case you didn't remember this, what I did is I wrote them on your paper. I wrote them on your paper with a definition. I mean, what does redemption mean? What does reconciliation mean? What does propitiation mean? What does justification? So here's what I want you to do today. When you take the Eucharist of the cup, at least these four things, when you take part in the cup, read those and praise God for them. Praise God. In your heart, in your heart, in your silence, commune with him. Let Commune through the Holy Spirit to him. So reconciliation, I gave you the Greek word, is a radical, this we've studied, is a radical exchange from a position of enmity with God in Adam towards a position of peace with God in Christ by the blood of, of Christ. I know that's a heavy, I know that's a lot of information, but that's what reconciliation means. And one of the things you should be thankful for, and when you, when you take part in the cup today, you read that and you have a thankful heart for that. Redemption means, redemption is the full payment, it is a payment in, in full of the required ransom in order to be released from the slave market, Adam sent 13 judicial charges by the blood of Christ. Propitiation is the appeasing of the wrath of God regarding the 13 judicial charges like enmity, cursing, all that stuff of, of uh, Adam sent by the blood of Christ. And then justification is the acquittal of all judicial guilt so that the acquitted is freed, is freed as forever just and righteous. Okay? Now, I don't know what you know. I don't know what you thought those words meant. We studied them, and that's what they mean. So, today when we do the Eucharist, we're going to do the body, we're going to do the bread, and we're going to do the cup. And we're going to at least talk about those things to the Lord with our hearts. We're going to go over, okay, I'm reconciled, I'm redeemed, I'm propitiated, justified. And listen, however you put that in your own terms and own words of memory, that's fine. But you need to understand the awesomeness of what that means. I mean, people say, yeah, I'm saved. But do you know what saved? Do you know what that means? It, when, in the cup, it means you've been reconciled to God. You've been redeemed. You've been, and listen, there are nine things, and we're just into four of them. But it's important. Then he goes on. He says, for as often you eat the bread. Watch this now. For as often you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death. What, what about the death? All, he, he bore all of our judgment of sin, past, present, and future. Boom, one time, done. That's a wonderful thing. And, and, and we proclaim his death. We proclaim it till he comes. The Eucharist is a silent proclamation. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that would be personal sin unconfessed in your life, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself. What do you examine yourself about? What are you looking at in your life? Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. If you're aware of any, you name them. First John 1 John 1.9, you name them, cite them, state them to God, and participate in the Eucharist. The Eucharist is for those who believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried, and raised from the dead. That's called the gospel. When you believe it, you get saved. When you get saved, you can participate in the Eucharist. I'm telling you how to participate. Make sure there's no unconfessed sin in your life. For this reason... Uh, uh, verse 29, for he who eats, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Then he explains, this is the reason many among you have become weak, sick, and a number of you sleep. That means died. Because you took you had a careless attitude about it. So, who qualifies to take part in the Eucharist? Those who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ for their personal salvation. Two, those who, in self-examination, know there's no unconfessed sin in their life. Mental attitude sins, none. 
sins of the tongue? None. Overt sins? None. As far as I know, none. Then you participate in the Eucharist. Okay? In fact, you're commanded to if you're a believer. Amen. And we, and of course, we encourage it here. We encourage it. Okay, so that's how we're going to do it today. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll participate in the Eucharist. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. To be functional in Him, you got to be sure that there's no unconfessed sin. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. You make confession and silence and privacy through your priesthood. As a believer, you're a priest, 1 Peter 2. It becomes your privilege to take part in this Eucharist. This is a high privilege. And so, our Father, we thank you today. Here we are another month, Father. Still, still as much in love, if not more, with you. Excited about all the ministries you have flowing to us and from us. Thankful for our missionaries out there in the front line. For the many ministries that are actively involved in our church. But most of all, Father, we're thankful that you loved us enough to provide us the only way we could be saved out of Adamic sin, and that's through the blood of a perfect Lamb of God that not only was sent, but volunteered to go to the cross on our behalf. can't tell you how appreciative I am. And I pray we would have a deep appreciation within our own souls as we take part in the Eucharist and realize there was a real body that bore our sins and drank the cup of our sins' judgment to allow us to be a part of the body of Christ today. with deep appreciation for it and how important it is for us to be of one mind, one spirit in communion with the Holy Spirit that we care about one another. We love one another. Even more than ourselves. For certainly that's what Christ teaches us. Encourage us today, Father, through this Eucharist for the ministry set before us. In Jesus' name, amen.